Yo, Philly, how you doing? Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball, past, present, and personal. My name is Bill Cachetis, and I will be hosting this podcast each week on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. We will explore Philadelphia's rich baseball history, and I'm not just talking Philly's history either. There was once another baseball team in this town. Of all the major sports teams, the Phillies, Eagles, Flyers, and Sixers, That team remains the most successful franchise in the city, having won nine pennants and five world championships. And they haven't even played a game in Philadelphia since 1954. I'm speaking of the old Philadelphia Athletics of the American League, managed by the legendary Connie Mack. We will also explore the rich tradition of Negro League baseball, made famous by such teams as the Orions, Giants, Hilldales, and Stars. And we will explore amateur baseball in southeastern Pennsylvania, especially at the high school and college levels. Each week, I will host a special guest. He may be a former major or minor league player, baseball historian, beat writer, or some other personality associated with the city's baseball path. This week, I'm pleased to have as my guest Mike Schmidt, the Philadelphia's Hall of Famer and the greatest third baseman in the history of the game. Mike is also the author of several books, including Clearing the Bases, A Hall of Famer's Search for the Soul of Baseball. Welcome to the show, Mike. Nice to be here, Bill. Um, I really uh, appreciate what you've done for me. I appreciate your uh, work around the Philadelphia area and your knowledge of uh, sports history, and I look forward to talking to you. Thanks. Let me start by expressing my, my sympathies to you and to the Phillies organization for the recent losses of, uh, of Dallas Green, Ruben Amaro, Jim Bunning, and Darren Dalton. Darren's loss in, in particular was, was difficult because at, at the age of 55, he, he was so young. I know that uh, you were teammates in the 1980s and that he had uh, tremendous respect for you. What do you uh, remember most about Dutch? Well, I guess uh, in the early um, teammate days, uh, Darren uh, was suffered from uh, uh, some pretty serious knee um, problems. And uh, I, I kind of watched uh, from the side, uh, wondered whether he would ever, ever be able to uh, rehab those knees to be able to catch on a regular basis. Um, and sure enough, uh, through uh, – uh, correct surgery uh, and his uh, courage and toughness and uh, and uh, our strength and fitness coach Gus Heffling, uh, Darren got himself back to the point where he physically was one of the you know the strongest and uh, most supple um, catchers in baseball for a long long time. So. In the early days, it was sort of his uh, toughness and his courage uh, in getting himself um, back to be, being able to withstand the rigors of catching uh, on a regular basis. And then uh, after that, uh, Darren made some adjustments in his hitting, and he became a uh, very productive hitter. Um, he, you know, he had a great career with the Philadelphia Phillies being on our wall of fame and uh, it's probably the team that he's most associated with, although he did go to the Florida Marlins and uh, actually was a part of a World Series uh, team um, with with Florida. And um, But, you know, his heart has always been with the Phillies and uh, um, he's a member of the Phillies wall of fame, as everybody knows. And what then um, became in, in the – latter years something that uh, I remember most about Darren was his smile and his uh, um, the aura around him in other words he people gravitated to Darren he was a very very loving guy he uh, bear hug and a kiss you know for everybody and uh, he shared his love and I think that's why he's missed so much is that uh, he He is sort of the people's catcher or the people's guy. He was a great leader, um, was able to draw his teammates to him. And he wasn't so much of a leader because uh, he drove in runs or because he was, you know, yelling and screaming in the clubhouse. It was because 
people felt uh, a passion and a, a warmth being close to him. And uh, I think he probably had more friends on the teams over the years than anybody I know. So, yeah, that, that, those are very, um, I want to say it, uh, <laughs> something that not, not many of us have, a combination of those three things. And um, that's what made him such a good friend and a uh, great teammate and what I remember most about him. One of the things that um, impressed me uh, about him is his ability to keep on coming back. Uh, as you said, he had uh, knee injuries, and, and because of that, he experienced success later in his, his career. Um, I, I guess you could call him, because of that, a, a late bloomer, a label that uh, was once uh, applied to you by the writers uh, do you agree with that assessment? Were you a late bloomer? I'd say yes, uh, uh, that I was, uh, and it's it's a pretty good comparison. Uh, all, with Darren, uh, I, I think he spent, uh, you know, a lot of this is just sort of guesswork in terms of the number of years and such, but I think Darren's early career, he was kind of a backup catcher, and, and, uh, and then he... Um, worked his way into being a regular catcher. I think that was pretty much mostly after I had retired in the, you know, in the early, uh, 89 and the nineties, um, and early two thousands when he became a very productive hitter. Um, so late bloomer is a, a, a pretty, pretty good label for Darren and for me. Yeah. Uh, but my, my, my blooming, so to speak came, uh, my late blooming came in college. I mean, I was, wasn't much of a prospect all through high school and my early college years and I bloomed late in college sort of my junior year and senior year and ended up being drafted but I was not by any means a high on scouts list and such in my early days and it wasn't until late in my college career where I became a prospect and yeah I struggled early on in the major leagues but um, my whole career was good but always a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, I the road to I success would, is always under construction. <laughs> you can say that. Uh, you know, I, I was impressed when I was um, researching your your career that uh, you know baseball is what you had left. I mean, you, you, you injured your knee uh, as a football player in high school, and you played basketball, but uh, you did so with a brace. And uh, you you weren't a walk on, I guess, at Ohio University, but uh, I'm not so sure you are really highly recruited. Uh, and and it, it sounds like baseball was something that uh, you just matriculated to because football and basketball were out of the question with those knees. Yeah, that's true. I was eliminated from football, future in football uh, in high school. And uh, the same reason that I sort of uh, had to pass on football was why I had to pass on basketball. I mean, you can have a love for a sport, but it doesn't mean you're going to be, you know, you're going to work toward a professional career in that sport. Uh, you know, size has a lot to do with it. Health has a lot to do with it. Uh, uh, speed, quickness, uh, um I could have played, I probably could have played college basketball, um, but not 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 to the point where I was, would ever have been an NBA prospect by any means, uh, not even close, actually. Um, but, yeah, uh, and, and I just sort of gravitated to the sport that was in season. Um, when it was baseball season, let's get the glove out. And when it comes around to football season, let's get the old – football out and uh, same with basketball I knew I didn't know any difference you know any you know uh, or have any preference uh, throughout my life no preference only came in college when I couldn't play the other two so I I, I in fact well you were right I really wasn't a walk-on in the sense that they had never never knew my name or never who I didn't know who I was I mean the assistant varsity baseball coach and at the time freshman coach we had a freshman team uh, back in those days, and uh, he had visited a couple. He had visited our high school to see a couple of other players, and um, on our team actually, who were you know better prospects than me, that they were thinking about offering scholarship money to. And I kind of tagged along with it, um, 
he knew my name. He introduced my, himself to me and basically said, uh, we'd love to have you come down to the school and, you know, try out for the team. So they knew my name. <laughs> That's about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I showed up for tryouts, and they hung a number on my back and uh, said, Where, what position do you play? And I went out to shortstop, and the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. Pretty impressive history with that, too. The uh, the three-sport thing, uh, you played football, basketball, and, and baseball growing up. And today, as you know, uh, coaches increasingly are pushing kids to specialize. And I, I really feel badly about that. I mean, I had the opportunity growing up in the in the 60s and 70s to to play three sports, even in college. Although I went to a Division three school, uh, I, I was able to play two sports. Uh, but today, I mean, my son's in in college right now. It's one sport. He's a Division three school, and it's one sport. You know, it, mm-hmm. it, it, it's it's baseball, and pretty much even at a Division three level, it's year round. Uh, isn't that it's a detriment of of an athlete? I mean, what, what do you I agree? Think? I mean, I, yes, I think it is. Uh, however, you know, when you get to college, you're kind of forced into specializing in the sport that you're you're in college to play. If you're a scholarship athlete, um, if you're not a scholarship athlete, I mean. Why would you want to play foot, intramural football, basketball, and baseball, or softball, or whatever? But um, if you're if you're recruited uh, by a college and you're you're getting your education for free to play a sport, then specialization is basically required. Uh, up to that point, though, I'm a firm believer in playing all three sports, uh, different kinds of movements, uh, different kinds of hand-eye coordination. Um, you get the benefit of physical conditioning through basketball. Um, you get the benefit of, uh, what would I say, in, in football of uh, physical contact and uh, um, weight training and the things that go, you know, that preparation for football uh, requires. And then, of course, in baseball, you get the hand-eye coordination of hitting a baseball and, and feeling ground balls and all that stuff. And, you know, obviously – Obviously, one can lean a little bit toward the sport that they love, but you should be with your buddies, whatever the season is, playing that sport. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, basketball drills uh, gave me a, a, a great sense of getting a jump when I was at first base off a of pitcher to steal a base. My first two steps were always tremendously quick. Uh, it wasn't that I could win a race or anything against the fastest guy on the team, but, you know, I can get out of the box and, and take two or three steps as quick as anybody, which made me a great base runner. I should say a really good base runner because of my time in basketball. I think it helped me run the bases. So that's just one example. But uh, I, uh, I, I highly recommend playing all the sports. And I think, you know, it's, it's the wrong direction to go in to specialize. And, then, and the last thing on that would be burnout. Um, I think you can burn a kid out by having a, couple of bats and a shoulder and you know and a backpack on a kid's shoulders 12 months a year and uh sending him to a personal hitting coach and um travel teams and and doing it year round i mean at, at a young age uh, by the time you get to be you know in high in, excuse me in college um you could be burnt out playing one, only one sport um and that that would concern me too if i was a parent but then again bill lastly we are looking at it from I'm looking at that from, you know, 67-year eyes. I mean, 67 years old, and I'm looking back at mine and my life, and uh, it worked for me. And it's not to say that it would work, you know, it definitely would work, and it's the right way to go. Uh, sometimes I get have to catch myself, and then I'm thinking that the way we did it back in the old days is the only way to do it. Um, so it's an opinion that I have about specializing. Mm-hmm. Mike, your your professional career uh, went over two decades, and it was a career that was uh, tremendously eventful in in Major League Baseball with the dawn of free agency. It was also still a, a time when a team could develop a core of prospects that younger fans could grow up with and follow for a significant part of their career. 
And that was true of the Phillies. In the 1970s, you were part of a homegrown nucleus that included Larry Boa, Greg Luzinski, Bob Boone. But that was only part of the strategy of building that 1980 World Championship Phillies. What else did uh, general manager Paul Owens and uh, his scouting director, Dallas Green, do to cultivate that World Championship team? Well, you're right. Uh, <clears throat> unlike today where you really couldn't uh, build a team in that fashion, um, back then we, we grew up together. We took our lumps together. We um, we worked out together. Uh, we traveled in the off season together. Um, we had Bible studies together. Uh, there was a, a core group of athletes in Philly that, by the way, included some of the Sixers and a couple of football players, a couple of Flyers. Uh, <clears throat> all of us um, grew up in the town together. We uh, most of us lived in New Jersey in the early days. Um, some in the same neighborhoods attended, you know, the same restaurants. and So we saw each other a lot. Our families got to know each other. We rooted for the other teams. I went to so many Sixers games and Eagles games and um, stood on the sidelines of the Eagles games, uh, sat in the seats. Uh, you know, Doug Collins gave me – I was at tickets. Uh, our, our wives, you know, we'd sit together in the Sixers games. I spent time in the Sixers locker room, uh, went to Sixers practices, um, just uh, a very much family town. Um, and I think that makes the opportunity to grow in a sport for a team so much more enjoyable. You know, you, you, you're together, you, you have a fraternity, a bond. And not only that, after baseball, you end up with friendships for life, um, people you uh, will always be close to whether you see them, you haven't seen them for a year or two years or whatever, uh, or you see them quite often, you are always going to get close to them, which which the gentleman you mentioned, we are close. Um, so you added a little bit of Tug McGraw and you added a little bit of Gary Maddox or you add a little bit of this, you know, uh, Paul Owens was able to do that and fill a couple of holes and you add a little Pete Rose in there and before you know it, we became world champions. Now, before we became world champions, we lost in the uh, National League Championship Series three straight years. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, we, we all had that burden of that happening, always seeming to fall short. I don't know what the heck would have happened to us if we'd have lost the 1980 World Series <laughs> or, or, the, or the NLCS in 1980. Um, but thank God we were able to pull that out and become world champions and Add that to all those friendships and the development years as we grew together, and it even made it for a um, you know a stronger bond between all of us. And you see that right now when you see the Wall of Fame uh, guys on the on the field for that ceremony uh, last night, and very special. And I only wish players nowadays um, could sense that kind of a fraternal bond. Um, I think it's very hard for them because. Players move around so much, you, you know, you don't get to know them in the same sense that we did back in the day. It's it's also a different game from the standpoint of, of evaluation, just on a daily basis, as well as looking, you know, for the amateur athlete with with saber metrics. You know, if a guy from the 1940s or 50s showed up and looked at the game today with the evaluation systems, I don't think they'd even recognize the game. It's so different. Um, and, and pitching. Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, pitching. That's also changed dramatically, and, and, and for me, that's just as dramatic as the evaluation uh, system. I mean, since the 1970s, when when you began your professional career, you know, there were there were hurlers, hurlers like uh, Steve Carlton, Nolan Ryan, Bob Gibson, who were used to throwing complete games and and winning 20 plus games a season. Today. A hitter can face as many as four pitchers in a game, the starter, the middle reliever, a setup man, a closer. Nor does it seem like that many of today's pitchers are, are willing to throw uh, a brush back, let alone deck a batter. I mean, you know, just, <laughs> right. just a couple of week, weeks ago, and I was, I was astonished at this. Uh, I went and I saw the, uh, the first game of the, uh, the Phillies-Astros series, and the, the starter, Vince Velasquez, surrendered back-to-back homers to Brian McCann, mm-hmm. 
and Alex uh, Bregman in the second inning. And back in the day, that next batter's going down. I mean, he's going to be mm-hmm. eating dirt. And Velasquez didn't th- even throw a bro- uh, brushback pitch to the next hitter, who was mm-hmm. the pitcher, Peacock. And mm-hmm. the guy singled to left off the first pitch. And I'm saying to myself, you know, what, what's going on here? You know, do, do you think today's pitchers are, are being trained the same way? Are they as tough mentally and physically as, as those um, you face? Well, that's <clears throat> sort of the evolution of the game. Um, it all started with the umpire having control of the game in terms of warning, uh, warning a pitcher and warning benches against uh, uh, up and in pitches, uh, pitchers that look like pitches that look like they're uh, intended to uh, communicate something to the hitter or the other team <clears throat> or retaliate. It started with that, <clears throat> and then it started with the you know entire uh, league. Uh, generation of pitchers that grew up in that world uh, in baseball where, you know, intimidation um, really is is not something that they grew up with. Um, And they also grew up, have grown up in an era where everybody is making a lot of money. Um, The old, uh, you know, I need the outer half of the plate if I'm going to feed my family. Um, sense that pitchers used to have uh, before free agency and before rule changes is no longer there. Um, generally, that pitcher on the mound, <clears throat> you know, is making a couple million dollars, if not twenty million dollars uh, a year, and the batter is uh, the same way. And that with the minimum salary is almost a million dollars, and you know, they're all very, very competitive, and they all want to. Um, win games and they all want to pitch well and they all want to have good stats and they all want to do that but they they don't factor in the value of uh of the old school you know what the old school the way the old school used to pitch now a good example of that would have been in last night's ball game um <clears throat> Cespedes, is the left fielder um was swinging as hard as he could at every pitch and falling over the plate like they, there was not even one inkling of the idea that the pitchers, every pitch the pitcher threw, Nola, uh, Aaron Nola, was going to end up over the middle of the plate, and that he he had no no worry at all about be, being hit by the pitch or you know having his chest move off the plate or anything like that, and he did hit a ball hard and then he hit a long home run. And in the third at bat, <clears throat> it was a close ball game. I think it was two to one at the time. Uh, this was about the sixth inning. Uh, he swung as hard as he could at two pitches, fouled them both off, and then Aaron Nola threw a ball that came very close to hitting him in the chin. Mm-hmm. And Cespedes looked out at Nola like, you know, what are you doing? Um, you know, gave him kind of a stare like, you know, are you trying to hit me or something? I mean, you know, he actually reacted. <laughs> reacted um, adversely to that. Very much a purpose pitch, <clears throat> and very much uh, too late, if you ask me. Um, but um, you couldn't swing the bat like that in the old days without, you know, with it, in the old days you'd get knocked down. You know, ha- batters don't go on the ground anymore. When we used to, our legs would go in the air and we'd fall on our back and get up and brush our uniform off and hop back in there. Um, sort of a badge of honor if you could uh, hit a line drive after being knocked down. Uh, but anyway, he struck him out and on the next pitch, <clears throat> and uh, I just don't see that that much. And they're just not – they're not trained in that way to <clears throat> um, watch the batter and if the batter's being over-aggressive, uh, the batter's falling over the plate, if the batter has taken away the outside corner, um, they just do the best they can to get him out. <laughs> you know, they don't they don't see that and they don't – they don't have to feed their family. Uh, that's the best way I can describe it. So it's just a generation, generational thing, and I, I don't see in the future it changing. Um, but I know one thing as a hitter, if I had no fear at all of the ball coming from the guy on the mound, I generally would hit that guy pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. And if you, you have a fear <clears throat> of the ball, if you have a fear of being hit, it adds an element to hitting that totally changes the at-bat. It totally changes it. Um, And uh, most of my career I hit with a little fear. (laughs) Mm -hmm. 
You know, we've mentioned uh, Steve Carlton, uh, Dick Allen, Pete Rose, who were uh, mentors to you, uh, as well as, as uh, you know, you had close friends on on uh, on the Phillies as as your career unfolded. Gary Maddox and Jim Cott come immediately to mind. Uh, how did those teammates help you survive the challenges of a grueling 162 game season? Well, it uh, a lot of answers to that question. First of all, it's the only thing we knew. Um, remember, we were we were getting paid to play baseball. Can you imagine that? Getting a paycheck for playing baseball, something we probably would do for free. <laughs> we were <laughs> we were uh, embarking on careers. Um, uh, we, you know, it, it was. It was pretty darn special to have been drafted and work your way up to the major leagues and being playing baseball in front of thirty, forty thousand people every night. Um, so that was just the way it was. Uh, we, we we lived in that world, and um, we really didn't know any other world. And <clears throat> we traveled with each other and lived with each other for um, seven months a year. In, in our case, almost year round here in Philadelphia. So we all kind of fed off of each other, no doubt about it. Uh, um, we talked about baseball. We talked about the game. We, we, we talked about how we could improve. Uh, uh, we, we lived um, baseball pretty much year-round uh, as a second, you know, secondary thing to our family. So um, <clears throat> mentorship or, you know, uh, friendships and leadership and things like that, require one thing i mean they require a they, re, they require people that sense a need to be led or want to be led or want to be uh influenced by other people players today have a sense of themselves that is much different than we did back back in the day uh, i mean if um if Willie Mays walked in a locker room and was willing to also offer some information to me um i just soak it up like you wouldn't believe but players today don't seem to have any kind of a need for um information or mentorship uh you you does that make sense in other words to be a leader you got to have people around you that want to be led um absolutely absolutely there's a lot of i mean in in teaching going through teaching as i age there are a lot of younger teachers that you know you want to offer your you know the the benefit of your wisdom with and for whatever reason, they don't want to take it. Um, so yeah, it's just, it goes back. It goes back to your specialization uh, question before. They've uh, their entire lives. Um, the, you know, the young men that make it to the major leagues now has been kind of a. I use the term bubble, and that's been used quite often in politics. But they have pretty much lived in a bubble. Um, a travel team. Um, neighborhood hitting coaches, um, videos, um, uh, social media, videos on social media, how to, uh, uh, watching major league players. They've lived in a world um, where they, by the time they get into pro ball and if they work their way up to the major leagues, they see themselves basically as stars. Um, Mm -hmm. They're on, they can see themselves on social media every day i mean i couldn't see myself when i played unless we were on the game of the week um mm-hmm. there you know there there weren't highlights on a scoreboard every time i hit um the world that they live in now is totally different than the world that i grew up in i i copied batting stances i wanted to you know try this try that do this do that uh, i wanted to be uh i wanted to be roberto clemente and you know, I, I, I everybody laughed when I wanted to be. I wanted to hit like Roberto Clemente or Hank Aaron, or you know, I had these lofty goals and I uh, worked like heck to get you know toward those goals. And I always believed I could reach them. And you know, nowadays they just they come to work. They're a star. They go through the same routine. Um, they don't look at scoreboards and see low batting averages. They don't they don't aspire to be the best in the league. Um, they 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 make a lot of money you know what i mean they they, they money is just ridiculous as everybody knows uh, 
I think all that lends to this idea that they don't need to be led. Does that make sense? They don't. They don't have a sense of need in terms of, of wanting to be led or wanting to have a mentor or recognizing people as their mentors. And um, I don't blame them for that. I believe it's all about the world and the generation that they grew up in. Um, if I, I'd be that way, too, if I played today, you know, because uh, the competition to get to the major leagues today is harder than it ever was. And they they've survived it, and they've gotten there, and – their way basically is the only way to do things. Mm-hmm. Of course, Allen and and Rose were were two of your mentors, but they were also two of your favorite players growing up, um, as you were for an entire generation of Phillies fans, including me. Uh, and one of the reasons for that was was the way that you led your life, both on and off the playing field. And, and that must have been difficult playing in the 1980s because that. That was an era of anti-heroes or, or a time when baseball's bad boys or, or rebels attracted uh, more attention and, and actually fed off it, too. Uh, I'm wondering, Mike, what, what responsibilities do you feel a Major League Baseball player uh, has to the fans, especially the younger ones who are looking for role models? Well, I would say, I would say that in terms of um, in terms of, uh, what do I want to say this, um, you know, being, uh, being outgoing and being, um, a player that, um, understands fans and, you know, does things in the community and, um, is affable and, um, you know, has a degree of showmanship and all that. I think players today, um, uh, uh, work with fans and, and how to, the word I'm looking for, to tell you the truth, I'm, I can't think of it, but um, their relationships with the fans nowadays, especially that I see around Citizens Bank Park, is wonderful. I think today's generation and their their interest in, in being one big family with the fans is, is tremendous, much different than when I played. When I played, um, we all kind of, well, there was a Tug McGraw, of course, and there was a Jay Johnstone, and they, they really stood out with their attitude about um, about the fans. Um, they brought the fans into their games uh, and enjoyed doing that. And, and in my case, I kind of put the blinders on and went about my business, and my, my business was all about um, where I stood in terms of players in the league, wanting to be the best player in the league. And I would basically um, – Back then, uh, I, I think I almost like didn't want anyone to get in the way <laughs> of me doing that, and I think it was a bit of a turnoff um, to fans uh, as their perception of me. You know, I mean, um, players nowadays. If you watch, if you watch those nights when they have the camera night on the field, man, mm-hmm. those guys go out there and they take their time and they pose in pictures and they sign autographs and. And they shake hands, and they take, you know, a nice hour to go around that field. And in our day, you know, it, it was a race to see who could get back into the clubhouse as fast as we could, you know. And we, and, and, and guys would hide in the sauna. Guys would hide in the weight room. And um, there's just anything we could do to keep from having to go out for camera night. And no one thinks in those terms nowadays. So uh, the relationship that the players have with the fans – today in today's game I think is very very strong comparatively speaking to you know to when we played so um, I don't know if that answers your question or not Bill I got a little wordy there but um, no I, I, what you was know, your I, question I, I, <laughs> but, <laughs> the question was you know what what responsibilities do you feel a major league baseball player has has to the fans and especially the the younger ones who are looking for role models and I think you're right I mean I I, I I'm really impressed by what I see down at Citizens Bank Park. I mean, the, the Phillies will, before the national anthem, they'll have a kid, you know, go to each base and yeah, stand yeah. Uh, there. We'll see with that a, today, uh, and, yeah, on Sunday, yeah. You know, and, 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 and that's, that's a really good thing, and that's a really good thing for this generation to continue to promote the game. Um, I don't, when, you know, when I was growing up, and and following people like well we called him Richie Allen then uh, and then of course you um, 
you know, those of us who are a little bit more introspective, uh, we're looking at, you know, what kind of guy is this? I mean, what really, you know, what kind of person is is this guy? Whereas, I think most other fans, and maybe most fans do, they just, you know, judge you yeah, on well, what your your on field performance is. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I was very um, sort of insecure and sensitive, and uh, I really, really wanted people to like me, but I never really put the time into, you know, to make that happen. I never, I never understood that. Well, if you want people to like you, you have to be more giving. You have to be more. You have to acknowledge other people more often. You have to have a smile on your face, and and that that would promote a, a, a friendship, or um, it would it would help help me to get people to like me and understand me a little bit more. But basically, uh, I, I that was very secondary to me. It, it's 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 a strange thing. I wanted people to like me, but I didn't do any work, you know, to allow people into my world. Um, some would say, uh, well, that's bad, and some would say, well, that's maybe why you accomplished what you did. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I was just me being me. But the persona that I projected was not, you know, not conducive to allowing people to get in and like me. Well, Dick I, Allen, yeah. the, the question originally was Dick Allen, Pete Rose, uh, uh, guys that were helpful uh, to me as mentors in my career, yeah, I used to imitate, uh, me and my buddies uh, used to, in college, stand at home plate and imitate Dick Allen, uh, try to try to stand like he did and, uh, you know, try to cock the bat like he did and we wanted to swing like he did. And in Rose's case, I saw Pete uh, play his first game as a Cincinnati Red, uh, had his posters, uh, had a poster on my grandmother's uh, bedroom door. Um, uh, his uh, uncle, Buddy Blowbaum, gave me hitting lessons, uh, and isn't it amazing that as time would go on, I would end up on the same team with those guys that I, uh, you know, that were heroes of mine when I was a young boy. Yeah, that that must have blown your mind. I mean, that that is that is living the dream right there. <laughs> no, uh, and, no question it is. You know, and, and of course, Pete, you know, he always had a quick uh, quip or remark, and and people loved him. He just gravitated and the fans gravitated to him it was natural for him it wasn't work that was part of who he was guy like dick allen uh you know he he kind of ran from people and it wasn't because he didn't like people it's just because he's very frankly he's a very shy person and you know he came from a small rural environment very protective environment and uh, you know, we all know his story about, uh, you know, how Philadelphia was back at that period of time. But, uh, you know, you really have to look deep and beyond the, uh, you know, the, the on-field play with Dick Allen to to find out what kind of person he is. Because he, he really is a very generous individual, very gracious, uh, really is much more comfortable with the common person you know, than he is with high-profile people. And that's just the way he is. Um, and and many people of my generation who gravitated toward him tended to be the rebels. You know, they were challenging authority because that's, you know, that's what they thought Dick Allen was about. I saw something completely different. I was fascinated with him because I felt sorry for the way he was treated and couldn't understand how, you know, one minute he would be booed and the next minute after he hit a home run, he gets a standing ovation in the same game, maybe within 10 well, minutes. Yeah, of, that's exactly know. right. And, uh, and uh, not to bring it back to me, but it was very much the same for me. Yeah. You know, we, we, we were similar people in that we were, were sensitive. But Dick is this very sensitive, uh, cerebral guy. And, you know, when you're like that, you kind of, Kind of look deeper into things that surround you in your in your life and people people's reaction to you uh, the way pe- what people yell at you from the stands. Uh, um, you, you, Dick could never just let it just you know um, slide off his back. Dick Dick thought about it and uh, he heard things and he he wanted to react to them and he didn't like that people could get away with. Them. Uh, you know, you know, treating him a certain way, and you know, he lived in a world where sometimes he wasn't allowed to use the same locker room or and and sit certain places on the bus, and 
the era of racism and god it was it was crazy difficult for him and you know he survived but he could have done more if he wasn't such a uh, uh sensitive guy and you know that that's a that's a nice trait to have um uh, to be sensitive and caring and uh, and all those things but sometimes it doesn't work on a professional athletic you know professional field uh in front of 30 40,000 people uh it's best that if you wear earplugs and don't hear them and i was the same way that's why i had such a tough time uh handling the booing at uh at veteran stadium i, I just couldn't understand it i was sensitive to it and then what my attitude just wasn't to let it um just let it go. I don't care. Uh, it's just the way they react to disappointment. I took it all. I always took it personal. I figured ten thousand people in the stands are booing me, and they must not like me. They must hate me. They don't know what what <laughs> what I do to try to uh, uh, you know to try to come through for them on the baseball field. Um, and then think, uh, the next at bat, I'd hit a home run, and all thirty thousand people would be cheering. I, you know, it was a you know it was a strange. Uh, sort of paradox really i um and and i know guys that just didn't even hear the booze they just didn't care they didn't they were they were able to just go on about their game and be themselves and it didn't matter to them but it always mattered to me and it always mattered to dick and we could never change you know we could never get we could never make change we could never uh it was always going to be that way and um both of us probably would have enjoyed better careers if we weren't so, so darn sensitive to things like that around us Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I think uh, the majority, the silent majority of Philadelphia Phillies fans, both back then and today, understood that. And I think, uh, uh, you know, we appreciated the way both of you guys, um, you know, led led your careers and, and your lives. Um, so n- no apologies at all necessary, and I think uh, – you know, it, it is a wonderful trait uh, to be sensitive and yet to be able to have the abilities that you guys had. And then once again, that's why a guy like Darren Dalton was so exceptional because he was one of those guys that, you know, okay, I'm not going to internalize this. Uh, the fans are the fans, and I've got my job to do, and this is who I am. Take me or leave me. And, you know, he still had that kind of sensitivity and that's why he is going to be so missed in in this city. Mike, I got one more yeah, question you know, for you. You can you can uh, see when they introduce the guys in the in the Wall of Fame, uh, uh, the, the the cheers from the stands, uh, the applause. Uh, people love Charlie Manuel because Charlie Manuel's uh, persona is uh, like he's just one of them. He you know he's not great with the English language. He doesn't put on any airs. He uh, um, um, he, he's a astute baseball man. He, he going from uh, the town, uh, uh, really not appreciating him much, to beloved, to a world championship manager, uh, and and that's why he got the loudest applause. Mm-hmm. And uh, Darren Dalton the same way, John Crook the same way. You know, they're they're all kind of like. I don't want to use this term with disrespectfully. They're like Mr. Everyman, you know, Greg Lazinski. The they, townspeople can really, really relate to these people. They're like one of, like one of their own, you know. And uh, in my case, in Dick's case, uh, wasn't that way, you know. We were, we were kind of, I don't want to say anti, but we, we, we were different. We were sensitive. We kind of played in our own little bubble and. Uh, um, the the relationship between fan and a player like that um, takes a back seat to you know the relationship that they had with those uh, with the Char- with the Charlie Manuels and Darren Daltons of the world. Mm. Well, yeah, maybe. I, I, again, I, I, I think that <laughs> things have changed uh, now. There's no doubt about that. As we've gotten older, as I've gotten older, you know, uh, uh, I definitely. Uh, I definitely moved to a, a different kind of type of person now that I'm older and I'm more experienced and understand all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. <laughs> you, you can't take away three MVP awards, a World Series MVP, 12 All-Star Game appearances, 10 gold gloves, and a slew of home run and RBI titles, which are all part of your Hall of Fame career. It's one of the reasons that you were so respected um, by the fans here, and yet you've told me before that 
you consider, of all those things, the single greatest achievement of your professional baseball career was survival, that you were able not only to survive but prosper for, what, 17 and a half, almost 18 years in the major leagues. You still yeah, now? Yeah, well, that's, you know, that, that's, that's well put. Um, I was able to extend it uh, much longer than uh, I would ever have thought. Um, I, um, I was very lucky, very blessed. Um, I mean, you saw Bryce Harper last night have a catastrophic injury uh, right before this great Washington Nationals team is going to uh, move into the postseason and be a contender for the World Series, and bing. He's not going to play, um, and um, it can it can happen just that quick. You know, one slide, one dive, one pitch uh, hitting you in the in the head, or something like that, and can stop and turn around a career just like that. And I was blessed never to have had um, that happen to me. You know, I could just keep moving forward, moving forward, moving forward, uh, reacting to the bad times and turning them into good times, and. Um, I never I was on a disabled list maybe twice in, in those 17 and a half years, and I got my 500, 600 at bats every year, and that you know that has to be luck to, to allow for that to happen. And uh, so I understand that. And the you know what your point was that uh, to survive or, or, or to accumulate numbers, uh, you have to be there for a long time. And be reasonably injury free for a long time. So yes, I was very lucky in that sense. Mike, thank you so much for joining us uh, on Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and uh, for, for the insight. and uh, And thanks for all you do and continue to do for uh, not just Phillies baseball, but for Major League Baseball. We're really fortunate to have you as one of our own here. And folks, uh, thanks, Bill. Stay tuned. You're welcome, and folks, stay tuned uh, uh, for Philadelphia Baseball Past, Present, and Personal uh, next week. Have a good week.